We go from colleague to Matt Caller, I believe I'm pronouncing yeah, that sure. right, yeah, from yes. Vikings Insider, purpleinsider.com. What's up, Matt? Hey, what's going on? Uh, also, I'm a community college guy, so shout out to all those people who went to community <laughs> college go, community and college. saved all that money and took the same courses. I'm just saying. I yeah. failed out of community college, so do I get a for that? <laughs> you know, no. There you go. Shout no. out to Kingsborough Community College in Brooklyn, where I uh, paid for a year of school and didn't go to class. That was a brilliant move by me. <laughs> At, the age at least of, you didn't uh, pay that much. Yeah, all right. Not uncommon amongst community college students, but uh, nowadays you got good community colleges here with Lorraine County Community College and Tri-C. Not like the scrubby one I went to. All right, we, we, we appreciate it. Let, let, let's, talk, let's talk about a couple of uh, former Vikings now who are on the Browns. Uh, and, and the Browns acquired two of them now. But let's start with Dalvin Tomlinson, who came first uh, to – which was really the most important need for the Browns because they had nothing in defensive tackle. How good do you, how good was he in Minnesota and how good do you expect him to be here? Yeah, I think that a good way to demonstrate that is that uh, at the combine, Quasi Adafo Mensa stood up there and said, basically, please come back to us, Delvin Tomlinson. We really want you back. Uh, and uh, of course, you know, he ended up getting more money than the Vikings could afford. But, you know, I think what's interesting about Delvin Tomlinson is when the Vikings initially signed him, they did it because they knew they really needed a run stuffer and they needed someone with a great track record of, you know, taking up two blockers and things like that. And what they found was a guy who was still getting better into his second contract and actually really improved his ability to get after the passer. Now, this is not somebody who's going to rack up, you know, 10 sacks from the defensive tackle position. But as a pocket pusher, as a guy who can create pressure, he is really, I think, improved over the years. And I think that says something about him. But he's one of the most intelligent players you're ever going to be around, one of the most beloved in the locker room, and a guy who's going to do his job on a very consistent basis. He's somebody that you have to actually go back and watch the all 22 to see it. And you have to focus on him because if you're just sitting at home on your couch and watching the ball, then you're probably going to miss a lot of the things that a defensive tackle does, but he could play right over the center. He could play in the three technique. He could play first, second, third down if you want him to. I mean, I, I think he's worth what they pay that he's a really excellent player. And if the Vikings would have uh, had it their way, he would have signed back here. Yeah, that's that's crazy. I, I would, I don't understand. This is this goes to I, I guess the way you construct the defense. When I look at the what the uh, the Vikings had, I mean, you you had Zedaria Smith, you you had Dalvin Tomlinson. How was their defensive front? How was the defense in, in general so bad? And you even had Hunter, Daniel Hunter over there. What like was it? Was it the just scheme? Was it the coach? How how did that happen? Because in a lot of ways, we were trying to figure out whether it was our defensive line here or was it the coaching that really caused us to be so terrible? Yeah, that and that's always the question, right? Like, is it the players or is it the play calls or is it the general scheme or what might it be? And it was a horrific defense. I mean, even when you go back and look at some of the quarterbacks that lit them up, Mac Jones had the best day of his career. Mike White went bananas against them. I mean, it wasn't, wow. and, and Daniel Jones got all that money just because of the Minnesota Vikings, but it truly had nothing to do with Delvin Tomlinson or Zedarius Smith. Those guys did their job. I mean, I, I thought Tomlinson was one of their better players last year and Zedarius Smith double digit sacks, top five in pressures. And uh, the same with uh, Daniel Hunter, who was also top 10 in pressures and double digit sacks. But if you can't cover anybody, you're going to get lit up in this league. I mean, because you're only pressuring the quarterback at best, what, three out of 10 snaps, four out of 10 snaps, getting one, two, three sacks a game, unless you're a really, truly dominant defense. So if you can't cover anybody, you're going to have a lot of problems. And that was really what it was last year. They were playing a replacement level nickel corner who just got attacked all the time. They completely switched their defensive scheme, but still had holdovers from the last scheme. And I don't think that that went very well, particularly Eric Hendricks. Kendricks is a great player, and yet last year he was kind of a replacement level player by the way that he produced, and I don't think that he suddenly fell off skill-wise or intelligence-wise. I think he just really didn't fit with what they wanted to do schematically, and they fired their defensive coordinator for a reason. I don't think it was just because uh, the numbers that they put up. I think it was also because they felt that he wasn't anywhere near aggressive enough, that they didn't blitz enough, which is why they've brought in Brian Flores. But I also think that it comes down to 
Cam Dantzler didn't work out as a corner for them. Shannon Sullivan didn't. They drafted a safety in the first round who basically didn't play. They drafted a corner in the second round who basically didn't play. Mm. I mean, I, I think it had a lot more to do with just the coverage unit than it did uh, the defensive line. Matt, Albert Breer was on a, another program in the city, uh, I believe two days ago, and was asked about Zadarius Smith, and he referenced he could be a Jadavian Clowney 2.0 in terms of his locker room presence and attitude. Knowing what you know about Zadarius Smith and his time in Minnesota, did you ever hear any rumblings about him not being you know, an upstanding guy in the locker room or have any character issues like that? Yeah, I don't know that I would say not upstanding. I think what I would say is uh, maybe beats to, walks to the beat of his own drum uh, could be that kind of thing. And and may, maybe also, and it's it's hard to make too many character assessments on, on guys because I, I don't know him deeply. In fact, he would have had to show up in the locker room occasionally for me to get to know him, but he never <laughs> did. Uh, he was never around. I mean, so we talked to him, I think once in training camp and once before the playoff game. And I don't remember him doing any media in between that point. And I think it got to the point where we as a beat had to like go kind of to the league and say, because players are supposed to be available every week. We're usually pretty lax on that if a guy's not around for a few weeks, but if he's not around for the full season, I think that's the only way we actually got him to talk. So he wasn't around really at all and wanted nothing to do with media. He wasn't going to be dapping up any uh, reporters in the locker room. And I also think that the Vikings expected he was going to be back this year. I think that they found out when everybody else did that he was leaving Minnesota when he suddenly tweeted something like, goodbye, thanks for the memories. Like, uh, okay, I guess Sedarius isn't coming back. And I think that they thought that he was happy with his contract after signing a two-year deal. Like, why did you sign a two-year deal if you only wanted a one-year deal? But from his perspective, if you put up the numbers that he put up last year and you look at what you're making cash wise and what other people are making cash wise, you kind of get it right. He was going to be underpaid and the Vikings had no cap space to do anything in terms of flexibility to give him more cash, which he deserves. So is there kind of an aloofness to him? Maybe I think it's maybe more of a, some guys see themselves as independent contractors. I'm here to do my job and get my contract. And I think that's okay. I, I don't know what Jadavian Clowney was like, but I think that that's kind of how Zedarius views his career is like, this is what I get paid for and I'm going to get every dollar I can. And I don't really care where I play. Yeah. I, I think uh, Jadavian Clowney had that. Now Jadavian, uh, he went and told the team allegedly uh, that he was only going to play on certain downs and distances. So that may be, uh, a, you know, a step too far as far as being an independent contractor. But, you know, let's, let's talk about Zadarius Smith and um, yes, he, he is a very good contractor to what he brings to the table, uh, if healthy. I mean, I, I said this earlier. I said, uh, even when you look at Jadavia Clowney and Zadaria Smith, Zadaria Smith has way more, uh, 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 he has better traits uh, as a pass rusher than a guy who, uh, who may be more athletic. Uh, when you look at his bend, when you look at him, him being able to turn and him being able to rush inside a little bit more, a um, little more functional power when he's transitioning to the quarterback. I said that Darius Smith probably is the best pass rusher Miles Garrett has played with. Do you disagree with that? No, I don't disagree with that at all. I mean, uh, I would have loved to have had more conversations with him about his pass rush in the locker room, but I have no, <laughs> I had, I have very little negative to say about Zadarius Smith as a, as a player. I have a ton of respect for what he does. I, the thing about him is he is one of the most powerful rushers you're ever going to come across. So he can take tackles and drive them back into the quarterback. And when they put him over a guard or over a center in a pass rushing situation, it is a complete mismatch, which usually is because of speed. But with him, it's actually because of power and also a very, very technical player. I mean, he's great with his hands, super powerful hands, but also has a lot of pass rush moves in his tool bag that he's developed over the years he is a guy that would prefer I think to play every single snap I, he, he was not a guy that was looking to the sideline when are you going to take me out uh, and only wanting to play in certain downs or something like that I mean this this guy played the whole second half of the year through a knee injury it hurt his production but I also think he didn't want to miss any weeks he didn't want to miss any time and it wasn't technically a contract year so I think he was really just that's a, the type of player he is he's an intense competitor down in and down 
down out. He's terrifying for the defense. And the biggest thing to me is the guy's football IQ. He knows how to rush from all sorts of different positions. There are a lot of guys who are only comfortable on my side. This is what I do. Daniil Hunter, they've tried to move him around a little. It's like, nope, you can't do that. He's only going to rush off that left end. But with Zadarius Smith, the quarterback comes to the line of scrimmage and he does not know where Zadarius Smith is going to be. And he's effective from all those different places. So, I mean, as far as an actual player, I mean, he might be the independent contractor type, but he fulfills that contract. I think everybody who has lost Zadarius Smith wanted Zadarius Smith to still be there. (laughs) Hey, Matt, you know, he comes over with Dalvin Tomlinson and chemistry along the defensive line between two different pass rushers is is a big deal. So the Browns getting two guys who have worked together in Tomlinson and Smith should help them assimilate into this new Jim Schwartz defense. When you look from a, I'm going to ask you from an outsider's perspective now looking at the Browns. So Darius Smith, Dalvin Tomlinson, Miles Garrett, they signed Oboa Quancro with some other guys they've drafted. I know it's kind of similar to that Minnesota defensive line with Garrett swapping out for Dino Hunter, who's also an elite pass rusher, but how do you block those guys? Yeah, I mean, I I think that what you have here is versatility with those players that you sign as well. I mean, because with Delvin Tomlinson, uh, we don't really think of interior fat guys as being versatile, right? We kind of think of them as just, hey, be in the middle, be Ted Washington, stuff some giant blocks in there and you'll be good and, and make sure they don't run for more than two yards every play. But that's not who Delvin Tomlinson is. He's not this big, giant, fat guy who can only do one thing. He can line up at three technique. In fact, he had the different roles from different years with the Vikings. They switched from a 4-3 to a 3-4 base system. So he was playing three technique at one point with Michael Pierce over the nose. And then last year he was playing more over the nose and uh, sometimes, you know, playing mixing and matching with uh, Harrison Phillips. So I think that gives you a lot of different things that you can do with him for how you're setting up your defensive line. And then with Zadarius Smith, you can put extra edge rushers on the field and put him at linebacker pretty much whenever you want because he's capable of doing that. Now, I I wouldn't want him playing in coverage too often, but uh, that's not anything anybody's going to do unless they're insane. But I mean, rushing from a lot of different spots, I I think that if you're an opposing offense, it's not just about blocking, well, this guy's good and this guy's good and this guy's good, but it's also blocking how are they going to look on third down? Where is this guy going to line up? And you can really load up. He allows you to bring somebody else off of the bench and put them at their premium position, which might be on the outside as well. And the Vikings didn't really have anybody who could take advantage of that last year. They had some young guys that they drafted, Patrick Jones, DJ Wanham. They got a handful of sacks combined. But if you have somebody who's actually good, who's coming off the bench and rotating, I think yeah. it gives you a ton of different options to use Zedarius Smith in a lot of ways. And he is totally comfortable doing that however and whenever you want him to do it. Matt, on, on June 2nd, is Dalvin Cook still on the Vikings? Uh, yeah, probably not. Uh, no, I'm going to, I would say no. Yeah. I mean, everything that they've done has pointed to Delvin cook, not being on the Vikings. I mean, it was only a couple of days into, uh, the free agency period where Alexander Madison resigned. And if you're Alexander Madison and you've sat behind Delvin cook for four years, waiting your turn, uh, I don't think that you're signing back that quickly unless they told you you're the guy. Because, I mean, this poor guy, he's a good football player, and he's just had to sit there and sit there and sit there. And the only time he's ever gotten his opportunities is when Delvin Cook is out. They didn't even use him as a rotational back very often. And I actually think that he did some things like catching the football and pass blocking a little better than Delvin Cook. But this team has been obsessed with Delvin Cook pretty much since he got here, which I understand. It's just that they would never rotate anybody else. So I think that he's got to be desperate to get his opportunity to show he could be a bell cow back. And he would have gone looking anywhere else if he didn't think he was going to get that opportunity. And then just to kind of solidify it, they draft a guy, Dwayne McBride. It was the seventh round, but the way that they talked about him was not like you would ever talk about a seventh round pick. Uh, they think that he has potential to be a significant player for this team. They drafted Ty Chandler last year in the fifth round. They drafted Kenny Wongwu two years ago. Like they've been preparing for this. They're throwing numbers at it. And when you look at the cap situation, they're, Still, even after moving Zadarius Smith, pretty short on cap space. They could use it to sign another pass rusher. They could use it to even just, uh, you know, when they're going to do extensions for 
TJ Hawkinson or Justin Jefferson or Daniil Hunter spread some of that money out into 2023. So they still need, uh, you know, more cap space. And I think that moving on from Delvin Cook is the right way to go. And plus, if you have an analytics GM, you can't be keeping a 12 or $14 million running back who's 28 years old, right? That just goes against everything you're supposed to believe in. Interesting. Matt, how long have you been covering the Vikings? Just out of curiosity. Uh, 2016 was my first year. So you were there for quite a while when Kevin Stefanski was the offensive coordinator. In your opinion, what would you, what's, what's, what's your take on Stefanski as an offensive creator and a play caller? Yeah, I mean, Kevin Stefanski, I think all of us who cover the team uh, thought that he should have been the offensive coordinator in 2018 for the Vikings when they instead went with John Filippo and uh, missed the playoffs that year with a lot of, you know, battling between him and, and Mike Zimmer. Um, Kevin Stefanski to me is like Gary Kubiak when, reincarnated when, when, <laughs> when Gary was here, although Gary's still alive. So I don't know if that's possible, but, uh, <laughs> when, when Gary Kubiak was here and you know, the legend of Gary Kubiak, I mean, the guy was around forever with the Broncos. He made the Texans relevant, which is not an easy thing to do. And, uh, won the Super Bowl with the Broncos when he came back to them. And, and so, you know, his resume, and I think that those two had so much in common. They had great synergy. They really saw the game the same way. The zone running scheme, the play action bootlegs off of that, using a lot of things that look the same, but having them actually be different. His screen game when he was here was absolutely brilliant. And I also think that the way that Kevin Stefanski got along with players and a very cantankerous coach, which not every offensive coordinator got along with, trust me, (laughs) um, I, I thought that his patience for dealing with people would make him a good head coach. And I know that it's been kind of an up and down, a a rocky ride there um, in Cleveland at times for him. But I've always had a very, very high opinion of him as an offensive mind and as a personality, as someone that really knows how to deal well with people. Matt, great insight. We appreciate it. Uh, Thanks for joining us today.